yesterday when, uh, when it started very briefly talking about noise and error correction. And that's going to be the main topic of, uh, of today's lecture. Um, we have many different ways of error correcting. Um, and I'll try to sketch some of these ideas out. Um, the major, the major uh, direction is really an error correction that's universal independently of what implementation you're talking about. So I look at it as a quantum computation and I give you a sequence of gains that if you keep applying somehow will reduce the error uh, rate arbitrarily no matter where the error rate is, in the qubits or in the, or in the gates. And so that's, that's, at the, that's kind of the most abstract way of talking about error correction that makes us uh, feel that we are confident that this could always be controlled in some sense. But then of course depending on the particular implementation, you may have certain other ways of error correction, and then you have these decoherence, free subspaces, topological, quantum computation, and X number of other different ways. It's a little bit dubious um, how useful they will be ultimately, but somehow, in some sense, they do actually reduce themselves to standard error correction. We are always talking about some kind of redundancy. It's always, I'm going to use a subspace of my system to encode the whole thing. And even though the whole thing is going to be noisy, this subspace is, is somehow not going to suffer as much as, uh, as, uh, as, as it would without the rest of it. And the question is how much do I need to add in terms of redundancy? So I think in a sense there is only one error correction. So it's not like all of these other ideas somehow are isomorphic. And you can probably map them mathematically one to one. Uh, a typical example, so I'll give, a, I'll give some examples and then I'll go into a, a bit more general theory of the whole thing. Um, you know, a typical example is to say, well, uh, you know, let's say, let's imagine I have a two-level two system. And ultimately the reason why this guy is going to, is going to, so one of the, even if you make this atom sit in a complete vacuum, there are no other atoms around, no collisions, uh, nothing else can, can disrupt this. We know that the electromagnetic field uh, somehow couples to the, to the system. And this on its own is enough to actually generate spontaneous emission. And this guy kills you ultimately. So basically, the coupling in some sense, Hamiltonian, this is, this is the coupling that's always on. It's not something you can switch off uh, easily. Um, it's, it's something that, uh, that basically lowers the state of your atom and excites the state of the field and then uh, of course it's a Hermitian operator, it's got to have the, the conjugate of this guy and that happens at some rate and it doesn't matter, there is always some finite rate for this to happen and, and if this was one mode um, I'll, I'll show you a little bit how this, uh, how this is derived actually, it's, it's a very nice way of doing things but if this was only one mode, then of course you would say everything would be nice and coherent. There's one mode of light sitting here. This guy goes down, the photon is created, and then of course because of the reverse of this process, this photon would ultimately be absorbed back and, and so on. But we know that, that the vacuum around us is effectively a continuum. There are many different states where the photon can go into. And so the typical Hamiltonian has some index k here. Uh, and you're summing over all of these k's. In fact, you know, for all practical purposes, this is an integral over continuously many modes. Really. Um, and, and now the trouble is when your atom emits, uh, it somehow emits into each of these modes and you don't know where the guy is anymore and it's incoherently lost. It's never going to come back simply because we are talking about infinitely many a continuum of these modes. And that's the usual, you know, Wigner, Weisskopf, or Born approximation, whatever else exists there, basically, in theory of spontaneous emission. Um, so even, you know, even if, even if you had a finite number of modes and discrete, this would be such a large number that you would have to wait for longer than the age of the universe for this guy to come back into the atom. So for all practical purposes, this is lost. Of course, you can say, well, look, I mean, I can prevent this. Here is an error correcting mechanism that's obvious. Uh, why, why do I actually allow this guy to see all the vacuum uh, modes? Why don't I put some mirrors around the guy? 
I just want to show you this principle of conservation of trouble that something always is going to prevent you from that. If you put mirrors around there, and now you say, ah, huh, I've got a discrete um, set of models, um, because I've got boundary conditions that uh, light, if you like, uh, the electric field has to go to zero at the edges. If you set up Maxwell's equations, basically these are perfectly reflecting mirrors, then I can only have a certain set of frequencies. I can have, um, I can have this frequency, or I can have this frequency, you know, or I can have that frequency, but basically I cannot have any other frequency around. It's not a continuum now. And imagine that your energy levels where you sit, where you are storing the qubit are completely off resonance with respect to all of these guys. None of these frequencies now matches the frequency there. Uh, what you've actually done then is prevented spontaneous emission. So you can, you, can, you can put the electron here in the upper state, put these mirrors, turn them on, and basically keep it like that forever. Great. And now someone says, but I don't want to just keep my, my memory. I want to actually do computation. And you say, no problem. Just shine some laser light onto this atom. But how can I shine the laser light of appropriate frequency when I'm exactly excluding the frequency that I need to drive the system? So you can have a static memory of this type, but you can't do any computation now. And that's the problem. This is not really a good error correction, because the computation requires exactly the same driving frequency as the one that you eliminate. Then you say, no problem. I'm going to remove the mirrors for a while until I interact. Yeah, but then you have the spontaneous emission that I talked about before, and that's going to kill you. So you can't do anything with this method, OK? Yes, it's a beautiful decoherence free subspace, but so what? What are you going to do? So I want to talk a little bit about noise and, uh, and how, how this was understood in the early days. And yesterday I said that there were issues about not being able to maybe error correct in quantum mechanics because you need redundancy. <coughs> and you cannot clone states. But then I said it's enough to be able to clone certain, in certain basis. And once you can achieve cloning in the, in, in, in the zero one basis, in the plus minus basis, then you're basically done. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you that shortly. So let me first talk about what kind of errors uh, a qubit can. So this is just one example, but now I'm going to go into the abstract direction and talk about qubits in general. So all of you know that, um, that something that's really different genuinely in a quantum spontaneous emission would be a little bit like a bit flip so this also exists in a in a classical bit that you know the bit up somehow flips into bit down uh, but what really doesn't exist in in in, uh, in classical um, computing is a phase flip and i think that's something that worried people that you wouldn't be able to to do this kind of error correction so if you have a state uh, a0 plus b1 what happens, and there are many ways of um, explaining this, and it's a question of whether they're all equivalent. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, in my derivation, they will all lead to the same result. But there's a big debate whether physically really they are the same or not. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that as well. So basically, ultimately, you know, if you if you don't if you don't exchange, if you prohibit energy exchange between this system and the environment. But we do allow uh, a, a more general interaction than that. Um, some kind of imagine some kind of collisions with, which preserve energy, but basically they disturb the state of the system. Then what you are left with is that actually the phase between these two states will ultimately become uh, less and less well defined, and after some time this will go into a state like that. And we all know that that if you write this as a density matrix initially, it looks like, uh, well, let's, let, let's make these numbers real numbers, not to worry about them too much. So this guy looks like that initially. And finally, <coughs> looks like, uh, like that, diagonal operator. And this is this famous decoherence, because the, the off-diagonal elements are known as coherences around these, these guys. And when they're gone, we have a state like that. Um, so now, how do we explain this, uh, this process? Um, you already know that I can write this as some kind of P of EM. In fact, in this case, it's just a projective, um, projective measurement. So if I multiply this, if you call this a state psi, and if I multiply psi, uh, project it onto 0, and then I project it onto 1, 
So this is like, you know, projection onto 0 of psi uh, and then projection onto 1 of psi, if you like, in the lazy, in the lazy notation. Okay? Then, then basically this projection will really kill any element that has 0, 1, and 1, 0. And it will give you this kind of, uh, this kind of operation. So we can write it as a completely positive map. And in fact, any noise, of course, can be written as a CP map at the level of, uh, at the, level of the system. But now you can say, well, I didn't quite understand the mechanism. You know, okay, you're writing it mathematically, but what's the mechanism behind this guy? And the mechanism, well, <laughs> now you enter all sorts of different <coughs> theories. One way of talking about this mechanism is to simply look at this as classical noise in the phase of the system here. Okay, so what this means is imagine that there is a process which leaves zero as zero. I mean, you could change the state zero if you like uh, as well, but, but it doesn't, it's enough to change one of them. And imagine that, that state one changes into some kind of e to the i phi one, but imagine that this phi is a random variable. Okay. How random? It makes no difference. It, it's just going to change the rate of this thing. So you can imagine that phi is drawn from some kind of a Gaussian distribution like that, uh, which is centered somewhere, whatever, equals phi equals zero. And then you can you just draw a random number, and you say, OK, I'm going to apply a phase pi divided by 57. And the next phase I'm going to apply is minus pi divided by 100. And I'm just going to draw them in some typical stochastic way. So this, there's nothing quantum about this. You don't have to quantize the electromagnetic field to get this picture. Okay? It's classical noise. Some people believe that there is classical noise in this world. Of course, you will see that I can quantize the full thing and I'm going to get the same result and I think that's the full picture. But it makes no difference. You can think of it like that. Why is this the same as dephasing? Why is this, if I keep applying something like that to a state like this, why is that going to give me a state like that ultimately? Okay. Um, on the block sphere, imagine that I have this state A0 plus B1. And what I'm doing now is with certain probability I'm applying a certain phase flip. Changing the phase incidentally between, between A and B amounts to me walking this circle here on the block sphere. Okay? I can only walk the circle because I'm claiming that there is no energy exchange between these guys. So the amplitude A, the modulus of A and the modulus of B always stay the same with this type of noise. I don't want any bit flips yet. I'm going to treat them later. I, I, only want, I only want the sign here to be changing. So basically, the first kick is going to take your state somewhere here, let's say. It's going to kick it by some angle. On average, on average I'll be introducing kicks equally probably in, in direction of plus phi as well as in direction of minus phi. So if the if the if the basically if your if your error takes you to the other side and now I'm sampling all sorts of errors like that like this then you can see that after some time if I average over these errors the length of of my of my block vector will become smaller and smaller so the average of these two errors will give me a state somewhere here and then I continue this kind of random walk on the phase, basically phase, phase random walk here. And you can see that what's going to happen is ultimately my state will be projected over here. And the phase is going to be completely averaged out to zero. It's going to be randomized. And this state here really is the state <coughs> a squared zero. I've lost all the information between zero and one. No superpositions anymore. That's the guy here. So this is your dephasing. So you know, if you think of a, of a two-level atom and you think the field somehow randomizing the phase between 0 and 1, you will get this kind of uh, process. And this is something that's difficult to imagine that, that could happen to a classical bit because superpositions make no difference. Let me now upgrade you in this picture. And I want to upgrade you because I want to show you the theory of error correction. And I think it's going to be much nicer if we start uh, thinking about this fully fully quantum mechanics. So there is a there is a way, incidentally, of capturing this
process in a continuous manner. And the way would be some kind of master equation treatment. So what you can do is you can say, I start with my density matrix, whatever it is, the starting state, this state. And now I ask myself, um, I ask myself, um, how do I describe the continuous evolution of my system, which is going gradually towards, so my state is now going to go in this direction as time goes on. And ultimately, it's going to end up in an equilibrium state. And if you keep randomizing the phase here, it makes no difference. It's a stationary state of this process. <coughs> how do I describe this walk conti continuously in time? And we already talked about a little bit this uh, Lindblad master equation. So basically, it looks something like this. Gamma is the rate, um, the rate at which the phase is kicked in this, in this model. And then you, know, you have something like sigma z. Sigma z because I'm defacing. Sigma z is the operator that sends 1 into minus 1. Okay. Um, sigma z rho sigma z, and then minus something like, um, well, typically it, it has the form um, a rho a dagger minus a dagger a rho minus rho a dagger a, but basically because uh, sigma z is a Hermitian operator and the square of sigma z is identity, these guys just end up being something like that. And if you solve this master equation, what you will get is that the state of your system goes down as e to the minus gamma gamma t. So if you look at the orthogonal elements of this, how would you do that? You would just project both sides onto the state something like e rho dot g. Because e e element and g g elements are not going to be affected by the phase. And if I look at this guy, how, how does it go, basically, as a function of the, of the initial? So I have to do that everywhere, you know, gamma over 2, and then it's a bit boring solving these things. It's, uh, it's easier if you sit down and, uh, and go through it yourself, but something like that, right? Um, and, and if you look at the action of sigma z on g, it doesn't do anything. Sigma z on e puts a minus sign, then I've got two minus signs, and so on. You solve this guy. What will happen with the all diagonal elements uh, is, is that they will go down at the rate e to the minus gamma t. So, so if, to cut the, the long story short, if I call this guy uh, e rho g, if I call it rho e g, that's the all diagonal guy, then, then um, this guy at time t will be equal to e to the minus gamma t, the same guy at time 0. Whatever was your coherence at time 0 will be suppressed exponentially according to this equation uh, after time t. So I guess most of you know these things. Um, OK. But what about, uh, still, I haven't really told you. Com so I, in, in a sense, I was introducing some kind of classical fluctuating field, and that leads me to, to defacing of this type. But what about this high Hilbert space picture? How does that help us with this? And, and somehow that really helps you to see how you should error correct. In this case, it's not so obvious what you should be doing with error correction. So let me represent again. This is a very simple example. And I think knowing all the instances of this guy is really very, very useful to get a clear picture of what's going on. What happens really in the dephasing is that you have some kind of environment, which I'm going to write down as a, as a quantum state now. You can assume that this is a bunch of harmonic oscillators like that, or a bunch of qubits and so on. So the environment really depends on what the physics is. If you have a solid state system, typically phonons, the vibrations are the ones that kill you. The same true for iron traps and things like that. If you have a two-level atom, a genuine atom, then of course it's photons that kill you, if you like. If you have a gas of particles, then it's the other particles that provide the environment and the collisions are the ones that deface you and so on. So this E could be anything now, really. And, and what happens is that you want to describe a process where this, this guy goes into some state of the environment E0. So you see, 0 doesn't flip into 1. I'm looking at a specific error. It stays at 0. Uh, but the environment changes as the result. And one, one <coughs> couples starts with the same environment, if you like, and ends up in some other state 
E1. And if I now write the total state, I'm going to get something like the density matrix over there. So imagine now if you ask yourself, what happens to 0 plus 1? I have a perfect phase between these guys. Then what happens is that you get an entangled state where 0 is coupled to E0 and 1 is coupled to E1. Okay? And if I trace the environment out, you know, if I write this as a, as a density matrix, I think all of you already know what this looks like. E0, and then there are the all diagonal elements, 0, 1, into E0, E1, and so on, right? Four of them. If you now trace out the environment, uh, all you'll be doing is computing inner products of the environment. So let's say that this is normalized, this is equal to 1. But here I've got an inner product of E0 and E1. Okay? And the same for the other of the diagonal and so on. So if you look at the qubit, the density matrix of your qubit now, now looks like, if I normalize it with 1 over root 2 initially, looks like 1 half, 1, 1, but the off diagonal elements, and there they are, E0, E1, and the conjugate, which is E1, E0. So here is how the environment enters the decoherence process. The overlap of the environmental states tells you how much the decoherence has spoiled your system. Um, if the overlap is, if they are orthogonal to each other, that really means that the environment has made a perfect measurement. You did the cloning in some sense, as best as you can. So 0 has been cloned into 0 and 1 into 1. When you trace out the environment, these guys go to 0 if they are orthogonal. But for anything less than that, if you don't run this operation for too long, you will get some kind of variation of these guys with time. Okay? So what happens for a small amount of time? Um, so now I'll be deriving something like this, but much nicer. At least I like it better than, than the master equation. I'm really deriving the master equation in some sense. Um, so this will be a function of, a function of time. And if you say, if you say, well, um, you know, typically now what what we would have is is if you compare this to this equation, what you want to say is that the overlap between e zero, let's say now this is a function of time, and e one as time goes on, this guy should go down at the rate e to the minus gamma t because I know that d phasing kills me at an exponential rate. I'm just looking at the equation there, trying to match, and what I'm saying is that the overlap between the environmental states grows bigger and bigger exponentially as the time goes on. And when, when they become orthogonal, that's it. You're deep phased. No phase is possible. So this is really like a, like a measurement that the environment performs on your system without changing the energy of your system. And that's effectively deep phasing. Can I derive that? You bet I can. It's going to be a very beautiful derivation. What if I have more environmental states than just these two? So this here is a very simple model how to, how to think of this. Imagine I've got lots of environmental qubits. Okay? I'm modeling a very complicated environment. Two to the, whatever, 20 systems, if you like. A typical macroscopic system. And I'm inserting my spin half into this kind of bath. They could be harmonic oscillators or whatever else. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in a superposition of 0 and 1, and I'm going to let my qubit interact with each of these qubits <coughs> one at a time. Okay? This is really like a process of thermalization. I've got my system, first it gets hit by one atom, then by another atom, then by a third atom. And because I'm assuming that there is zillions of atoms around, it's never going to happen that the same atom hits this guy twice. And that's going to be the irreversibility. So the irreversibility only exists if you have an infinite environment. There is no irreversibility in this universe, in other words. I don't believe in it. It's just an apparent irreversibility. Like I said, if you wait for long enough, everything comes back. Um, but uh, of course, it's usually too long. So imagine the first now introduction. What do I get? I get 0, E0. I'm just following the recipe there. 1, E1. OK? And now I run it for another. So the rest just stays in the state E. Okay? And so on. Now I again interrupt the system 
with the next qubit from the environment. Okay? So what I get now is 0, E0, E0, plus 1, E1, E1. And you can extrapolate this yourself, actually. So the rest, again, stays in the state E. And now I do the third time step. So I'm trying to derive a continuous evolution out of lots of these three things that I'm going to let go to 0, and I'll show you how the exponential comes out. So the final state, once I've interacted with all of the all of the atoms of the gas is going to be zero coupled to many, many E zeros, basically. It's like a GXZ state of some, of some form. And one coupled to many E1 states, OK? That's it. And now, and now I'm going to chase out the environment. And I'm going to say, what's the form of my density matrix of my qubit? And the form of my density matrix of the qubit is again one half, okay, I've got one on the diagonal, but here I've got E0, E1 in a product to the power of n, as many systems as I have, as many qubits as I have in the environment. So there's just n products, inner products, okay? So this is now E0, I, I think this should really be simple to, to see, to the power of n and then the conjugate of that guy, as always. Okay? Here is my density matrix. And now I say, what happens if, if every collision only alters the state a little bit? That's called the Born approximation. Very weak interaction. My atom hits the spin, just changes it a little bit. So what I'm saying is that these guys are almost one and the same state. I don't allow them to be very different. What does it mean mathematically not to allow something to be very different? It means it's 1 minus some epsilon, small number. Okay? But I've got it to the power of n down there. The total thing here, this guy, is 1 minus epsilon to the power of n. Okay? What is epsilon? Epsilon is the chance that I had a collision. If you tell me that the rate of collision is gamma, then this guy is the total time, gamma times the total time of interaction divided by n. Because I'm slicing my time into n different couplings to the power of n. And everyone knows this goes into e to the minus gamma t. There we go, exponential decay. Okay. Two assumptions. One is that that this is a weak interaction in every step. The second one is I never see the same atom again. Okay? The environment is infinite. And unless you have this two, you're never going to get the result that I'm talking about. So if you stop after 100 atoms, you're going to do the same thing over and over again in the same way. Here is actually the true picture in many ways of, of the basing of your system. Okay? Now you can, of course, see that I can capture any error in exactly the same way if I extend my environment. And that's really, that's really very nice. Um, let me just show you that. And then we can, we can actually start talking about how to reverse something like that. <coughs> so the tricky bit is going to be that, in principle, I cannot control my environment. So I cannot, if I knew the environment, and if I knew exactly what was going on here, then, of course, I could apply the inverse. Each of these is a unitary transformation. I can go backwards, and I can always recover the system. But I have no idea which of the 10 to 23 atoms hit my spin at which instant in time. It's the same logic as Maxwell's demon. You know, if I had this information, I could do whatever I like. I could reverse anything I like. But I don't have it here. I don't know the label of this guy. Was this the 10th atom or the 100th atom? What was the next one? And I think that's actually the origin of irreversibility in the universe, as best as we can do. We can't do better than, than that one. OK, so, so what's, the, what's, what's at stake now? What's at stake is that I should assume that I have no idea how to, how to handle the environment. Um, and, and, and all I can do is, instead of preparing 0 plus 1, I can prepare something more intelligent than that. Maybe I can add a little bit more qubits there, each of which then interacts with some kind of environment in the same way, but collectively I can deal with them. Okay? 
And so this was, this was exactly what was at, uh, at stake. Let me just show you that you can do any error in this way. I start with zero and environment always. This is now a single qubit and the environment. And, and what I want to do is I want to write the most general unitary coupling between the two. Um, this is now going to go back to the, to the statement that I made yesterday, that classical bits can only flip, and then you know how to correct that. But it seems that a quantum bit can suffer any unitary transformation that I don't know. So how am I going to correct for infinitely many possible things that can happen to my qubit? And now I'm going to show you that there are only three things that can happen to your qubit. Okay? This is like discretization of, of, of errors. In quantum, in quantum physics. So it looks as though my qubit uh, can point in one direction of the Bohr sphere and the noise can take it to any other direction. But this is actually not true. You can view it in a much simpler way. Why? Because the most general thing that can happen in quantum mechanics, this all goes to the most general evolution, is that this zero stays zero. And I'm going to put the environment, now I need a little bit more indices here. I'm going to call this state 0, 0. Why? Because 0 has gone to 0 itself. Okay? Now, if it goes to 1, then I'm going to call this state 0, 1. It's very beautiful, this kind of uh, picture. Um, and you can see, you can see that, that the, other, the other guy is exactly the same. So basically, I've got, I've got 1 here. Or let's, let's, let's label it in the same way. 1 flips to 0. And I've got 1 to stay as 1, and the environment is 1, 1. So the environment has four different states depending on what's happened to your qubit. This is it. It doesn't get more general than that. Okay? I'm, a, I'm a typical theoretical physicist. So if you say, what happened to A's and B's? Where are the amplitudes there? Where is the cause and sign? It's sitting inside of here. They're not normalized. It's much nicer to do for that. So if you say, can't you have something like that? Yes, you can, but I'm putting A inside of this guy. So I'm saying 0, 0 times 0, 0 is not equal to 1, but it's some amplitude A. If I do that, it's a much more shorthand notation, and I can handle this much easier. The same with everything else. The only condition you really need here is the orthogonality of these two guys. Why? Because the initial two states are orthogonal, these guys are orthogonal, that means this inner product has to also be orthogonal on the right hand side. And because these guys kill each other, the, the cross terms, I only need to worry about this. So my conditional of orthogonality here is that 0, 0, 1, 0, plus 0, 1, 1, 1 equals 0. That's the only condition. Everything else is free. Nothing more general than this can happen to my qubit. Okay? And now you enter with the superposition state. And you say, what is that? What can happen if I give you a0 plus b1? So you see, it's useful now to hide these coefficients inside. And I'm going to say, OK, so, so what about the state that I want to preserve? It's a superposition of states. Now I want to preserve the amplitudes and I want to preserve the plus sign as well. What does that mean? Um, so you see, that's why I keep saying that you should not be dogmatic as physicists. Even if you don't believe in the church of high Hilbert space ultimate, sometimes it's much nicer to see some things in that picture. You should be opportunistic just as I am. Okay? <laughs> So basically, if the many worlds is the right language, go for it. If you think collapse is the right way of talking about things, P of M, go for it. But it's not as nice here. It's just not going to give you the, nice, the same nice beautiful thing. Of course, you can do the same afterwards. But you should not be dogmatic. And you should detach yourself emotionally from all this philosophical junk in physics. And just go for it. Be ruthless. Okay? That's a very important message. So, so basically, this guy now, you can see that 0, E0, zero, it's going to go into this. It's a linear evolution. So basically, A0, E is going to go into A0, we just write down the whole thing, plus A1, E0, 1. I want to expand it because it's going to start reminding you of something that you've seen probably X number of times. Uh, already. One of these things is called teleportation. Now I'm going to expand it and it's going to look like I'm teleporting something. 
Um, so basically, zero e goes into into zero e zero zero and one zero one, and then b with one one e goes into into zero e one zero and goes into one e one one. Can't be anything more general. If you want to describe how big the effect is, all you need to do is talk about the overlaps of these guys. Other than this, which you have to have, all other overlaps are open to you. Do you want to flip a lot in one instant on time or just a little bit? Make this overlap small or make it large. It's really absolutely general. You can't find an, an exception to what I'm writing down now. And, and now you say, aha, this is very interesting. Uh, because what I can now do is I can flip these guys okay, into some kind of, into some kind of uh, rotated basis. So instead of writing this as E00 and E11, what happens if I send this into E00 plus E11 and E00 minus E11? So what I'm, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to rotate the environment. But I'm rotating it in my head. I'm not doing this in reality because I already said I can't do anything with the environment. But I'm just saying it's much nicer if I look at it in the rotated basis. So I'm going to look at something like E00 plus E11 basis. Or E01 plus minus E10. These are like the bell states, you know? 00 plus 11 minus 11. Zero singlet and the triplet. You know, you can call this basis some tilde basis if you like. Um, e tilde plus minus or zero, or whichever logic you want to use there. But basically, my point now is that this state looks like that: a zero plus b one multiplied by E0, 0, plus E11, one, one, or something like that. Maybe I didn't quite bother to do it properly, but it's roughly like that. Second one is A sigma Z. Let's write it even more nicely. Sigma Z operating on that. Sigma Z changes the plus sign into a minus sign, times E0, zero, zero minus E11. One, one. So what I'm saying now is if you rotate your environment and you regroup the states of the qubit, you will get four possible states of the qubit. They're going to be equal to the state itself plus the state acted on by sigma z plus the state acted on by sigma x and plus the state acted on by sigma y. And each of them is going to correspond to a different environment. I think this one would be something like E01 plus 10, and this one will be E01 minus 10, whatever. I mean, some, it doesn't really make any, any difference. You can always factor it out by that. E01 minus E10. Sure, you can find some mistakes here, and that's very good for, for your practice. So the point is, I haven't done anything other than rotated the, the environment, but now I'm showing you there are only four things that happen to your system. Nothing, that's the good news, no error. If you play it properly, this is over a short period of time, this guy is going to have the dominant overlap. To a highest degree, nothing happens to your system. Then, sigma z can hit your system, that corresponds to a different environment. Then, sigma x can hit your system, and finally, sigma y can hit your system. I'm really writing it like a teleportation. If you could measure the environment now, you'd have no problem recovering the state. Okay? So if you measure this guy, you say, ah, all I need to do is apply sigma y, because sigma y squared <coughs> takes me back. This is the same as teleportation, dense coding, faster state quantum computing, you name it. It's all the same always. Okay? So here it is. I only need to worry about four things. One of them is nothing, so I don't need to worry about that at all. So I want to start showing you how this is how this is done. I don't want to keep it for too long. I think it's basically two minutes to, to break anyway. So I think it's probably a good point to make a break now and then come back and I'll show you how to correct. So basically the bottom line is I only have to take care of three different errors when it comes to a qubit. That's the main message. <laughs>
let's let's conclude this part. Um, that's the that's the central equation, equation that I wrote down, and and for, for what I'm going to say, um, um, it really doesn't matter how you look at the, the evolution when you have many qubits now. So ultimately, we want to say each of the qubit now couples to its own environment of this type. But you don't even have to assume independent environments of each qubit. That could be one way. But you could have one environment for all of the qubits. And I think that just means you label it in this very, in this very fashion here. So if you have lots of zeros in your qubit state, then this guy is just going to have lots of zeros to go into lots of... You can see that I can do now whatever I like. So basically, if I have two qubits, I could assume that each of these guys has its own environment. <coughs> Fantastic. And now this guy evolves according to this, and so does this guy. But I don't need to bother with that. I can say they've got the same environment, and basically what they can do is go into zero, and now basically this is going to have just a little bit more indices. So this means the zero, zero went into zero, zero, and then zero, one, and I think now you're anticipating the rest of it as well. Okay, zero, there are four states here, yeah, okay? And now I have to give it, give it for every basis here element. And I can describe a single environment. I'm not assuming that there are no assumptions on the environment other than quantum mechanics, uh, which we believe makes sense to us anyway. So, so I'm not making any approximations here whatsoever. That's why it's as general as that. So let's, let's first think of what we can do with a single qubit. With a single qubit, I said you can write, you can write state A0 plus B1 after the action of the environment. You can write it as, as uh, let's call it the state psi, so I really don't have to write these a's and b's all the time. It goes into psi times, let's call it e0 state. Of the, I should put tilde. I don't mean any of these 0, 0 state. I mean in the rotating basis, if you like. Plus, plus sigma z acting on psi. This is the one that kills the phase, that flips the phase, times some other state of the environment, e1 plus sigma x times uh, psi and some other e2 tilde and then finally y psi it's really like teleportation very much the same trick as the expansion of teleportation you can always do that if you have two qubits this is just going to translate into products of x's and z's so, so I'm going to have for two qubits what can happen is, is exactly like identity or identity on one sigma z, and you, all of these combinations are now possible. Sigma y, and then sigma x, sigma x, and so on. There are basically uh, four times four <coughs> possibilities uh, for something to happen. So you've got single qubit errors on each of the qubits. You've got no error, and you've got joint two qubit errors on both of them. And now. I'm effectively discretizing something that's in fact a continuous evolution. This is a continuous evolution. This can evolve in time. Uh, and, and these guys will, will be dependent on time and so on, but they don't care because what it boils down ultimately is a combination of these kind of errors. And so now I have to be able to correct for them. And we know how to correct big flip. Uh, because, so now we'll go into a little bit of general theory how to construct these code words and, 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 and where are the constraints and so on on, on these things. Um, and the logic is the following. Um, uh, what I need to do is I certainly need to protect against sigma x, but that's kind of the, the least unusual error because sigma x uh, sends 1 into 0 and 0 into 1. And it's really the same error as, as, as classical um, computing uh, would, would lead to. So I said last time that if you are really protect, so imagine now your interval of time during which you are monitoring the system is very small, so that it's unlikely that anything more than this happens. You'll see in a second why I need this assumption. So what I'm going to do is, is do some kind of redundancy. Okay. So instead of using one qubit zero, I'm going to add two more qubits in a state zero, and instead of using uh, using one, I'm going to add two more qubits in the state one. I'll draw a network in a second for, for doing something like that. So basically, uh, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to now superpose them, because I really want to preserve the superposition. It's not that I want to preserve each of these states. But you can see that classically, if one of these guys flips, 
what this really would mean is a state of this type. In this case, this would be 0, 1, 1. So in each case, you know how to go back because you just do whatever the majority of these guys does. You measure these guys and then you flip this guy to get the majority. And I want, I want at most one error because if I have two errors, then majority doesn't tell me anything. And if the time is short enough, I will have only one error to a high, to a high accuracy. If you say, what happens if you have two errors? Then I'm going to add two more qubits. That's where the redundancy comes in. So the more errors you ask me to handle, the more redundancy I have to add to my system. And that's called the humming bound, the, re the relationship between these two. I'll derive it in a, in a second as well. So now how does this work? I send in A0 plus B1, and I've got two extra qubits, which are my, my uh, redundancy qubits to, to preserve this superposition against sigma A's now. And this is just to show that, that, that the same classical logic works. So basically, this guy is going to go into A00 um, and B111. Okay? And if I get a flip, um, so now, now you remember the logic of this expansion here, that only four different things can happen. But I'm not using any environment here. Now I'm tracing out the environment. If I were to trace out the environment here, what I would get is a mixture of four possibilities here. And that's what I'm doing now. So what I'm saying is that with some probability, this will stay the state it is, in which case I'm not going to worry about it too much. With some other probability, one of these bits is going to flip. There are three possibilities here. So basically, I can have 0, 0, 1 plus B, 1, 1, 0, and so on, right? So basically, um, there are only four possible states because I'm only allowing no error or one error at most, okay? And other question is, can I detect it? Can I correct it, but in a, in, a, in a coherent way? I don't want to be making any ground measurements in the 0, 1 basis and destroying the superposition to start with. So how do I do that? Um, I, I drew this network yesterday. So the first qubit is in, in this state. And then what you do is you enter with, with state zeros for the other two qubits. Then you do a control knot. And then I'm preparing this state. This is two C knots, basically, a control knot. Now I've got the encoded state here. Now I let the error happen, which is this guy here. Here is the error, if you like. And now I say, can I read out what happened to my, to my qubits? And the idea is, before you read this out, you just invert what you did initially, and then you can measure these last two qubits. And it's not going to spoil your coherence, because this is a very intelligent way of doing things. You will still maintain a superposition. Why am I saying that? Um, look, at, look at the state. Take this state where, where I have one error on the third qubit. And let's look at it. What happens? What happens? So this is the state after the error. What happens if I do a control knot and another control knot? So I'm doing a control knot between the first and the last. These guys commute, actually. It doesn't matter which other. So I'm doing a control knot here, first and the last. This is 0, nothing happens. This guy goes back to 1, 1, 1. So the first control knot gives me 0, 0, 1 plus 1, 1, 1. OK? And then the second control knot, if you like, is basically the guy between the first and the second, in which case I get zero here. And my syndrome, this is what I call syndrome, the last two qubits, is now decoupled from the state itself. So what I have is A0 plus B1 and the state 0, 1. Great, I recovered the original state. And you can say, oh, uh, you, you cheated. Wait a second. I mean, there's something funny there. You, you, you made the error on the, on the third qubit. The second and the third qubit didn't met in the first time. Why don't you show me what happens if you have an error on the guy itself? Is that going to be protected? And of course it is, because all of them are going to be protected. So let's just do that example. Imagine that I, that I have an error on the first, on the first, on the first qubit which means my state is now 100 zero zero plus B011. Zero one one. Now I'm going to do a control knot, another control knot. I'm here now. Control knot, control knot. And you see, this guy is going to create 101. One. 
and the control node here is not going to do anything. Zero, one, one. <coughs> and then another control knot, which in this case is from the first to the second, okay, is going to create um, basically A111 one, one, one plus B011. One, one. Okay? Great. Why? Because this is A1 plus B0. Syndrome is still decoupled, but this is not the state you want. But who cares? You can measure the syndrome, and when you see 1, 1 in the syndrome, flip the bit, apply sigma x. That's called a Toffoli gate. You can even do it unitarily. Now I'm telling you that you can measure the syndrome because it's decoupled. It makes no difference. If I get the syndrome in these three states, I do nothing. This one tells me nothing happened. This one tells me the second qubit suffered. This one tells me the third qubit suffered. This one tells me the first suffered. That's the guy. So I need to apply sigma x to it to bring it back into A0 plus B1. The full network, now brainlessly done, without any humans, any measurements, no cats, no dogs, and stuff like that, is like that. Full <coughs> unitary correction of errors. Sounds a bit weird, because error is something that's random. And I'm correcting it entirely. How cool is that? Okay. Because of the dumbness. This guy always comes out in a state A0, 0, 0 plus B1, if you check it. Always. Um, <clears throat> great. I can fully unitarily handle sigma x. But of course, you can say that's really not that surprising, because we know that sigma x is the same as the classical error. And all you now did is error correction in one universe simultaneously with error correction in another universe. We know that that can be done. There is no problem with that. Okay. So it took a little bit of time for people to realize how to handle the sigma z because that's the real, that's the real quantum error, like I said. And that was the key, key thing. Once we had that, of course, everything else was. Um, so I need two qubits to correct against one sigma x error. How many extra qubits do I need to correct against sigma z? <clears throat> so basically, what sigma z does is send 0 into 0. So sigma z of 0 is still 0. But when you act on 1, you get minus 1. That's this dephasing that we talked about, the Arthur master equation and the all sorts of other things. Can I protect against that? <laughs> Notice I'm never talking about the environment anymore. I don't care what the environment does and how it does it. Um, and, and there is one simple thing that you have to realize, and then I, have, then I can stop and do nothing else, because it's the same as the story here. I have to convert that error into this error. So the question is, what does sigma z look like in the basis 0 plus 1 and 0 minus 1? in the complementary basis. Sigma z acting on the state plus doesn't do anything here, but puts a minus sign here. So state plus becomes state minus, and state minus becomes state plus. Great. I've got a bit flip, but in a different basis. This is the same as 0 going to 1 and 1 going to 0. I already showed you how to do it again. I don't need to do it again. All I need to think of is that the control knot is not a control knot. Because control knot is a control bit flip. Okay? But it's a control sigma z. It's called a control phase gate. It's the same up to the rotation, other rotation. That's it. So, so how do I encode now against, against these states? Well, what I do is I create state plus, 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 minus, minus, minus. That's going to be my encoded against the phase, the phase gate. So I'm just going to couple them in the, in the sigma z basis, not in the sigma x. Now I'm going to let the, an error take place. What's an error? Flip from plus to minus. It's the same old story as there. Let's say this guy flips. No problem. I run another C phase, C phase twice like in that picture, and I'm going to recover the initial state. So I can protect the phase, because the phase error in the complementary basis is the amplitude error, actually. We know that from interferometers. That's why we do a beam split and another beam split. So this is what this says. And I think once this was realized, everything was great, because now I know how to do sigma x. I also know how to do sigma z. And the question is, how do I do sigma y? Piece of cake. It's a product of sigma x and sigma z. It's going to happen naturally once you know how to do these guys. 
So the conjecture is the following. And I want to show though that this logic actually works in general now. Um, so the conjecture is like this. I have a single qubit in some state. And I want to add two qubits to protect against sigma x. Two extra qubits to protect against sigma z because they're independent errors. They happen completely independently. And presumably, I don't need any extra qubits for sigma y because I've covered it through sigma x and sigma z. It's just the product of sigma x and sigma z. So I'm fine. So is 5 qubits the smallest code to protect against errors? Yes, it is. Okay, we have it. It was done like 10 years ago. So we know that that's the case. It wasn't the first one, actually. The first one was 9, 9 qubits, because Peter Shaw thought that he always had to do this for sigma x, another 3 for sigma y, another 3 for sigma z. He didn't see that he was overdoing it a little bit. So with, with, with 9 is fine. Then Andrew Sting came along and said, you don't need 9. I'm going to do it with 7, OK? And then these guys came along with the PR and says, no, you don't really need 7. You only need 5. So the question is now, what's the general number for these things? And that's what's known as the coming bound. Um, the logic goes like this. Think about it classically, first of all, and I think it's going to be very easy to generalize it to quantum mechanics. I want to protect uh, a certain number of bits against a certain number of errors that can happen to these bits. So think of the, think of the, the Okay, think of the uh, set of states. This is going to be like a phase space for, for qubits, whatever this may mean. Each of these dots is now going to be a different state of your, of your qubits. So let's say you have, uh, you have n qubits, if you like, and so on. So n qubits, and I'm going to partition them. In some sense, I'm going to have k out of these n qubits to be my, my information carrying uh, guys. In information k. Those are the guys I want to protect. And then the rest of them, n minus k, are going to be the redundancy. Okay? So now the total number, of course, is n here, and that's what I'm drawing here. So the first dot here is going to be something like all zeros, n zeros. The next guy is going to be something like all zeros and one one. Um, <coughs> This guy I obtain by flipping the last bit once. If I flip the next bit, you know, I get something into 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on. So I walk this down. Of course, this is going to be some kind of hypercube, if you like. You can't just do it as a two-dimensional object. But every time you, you make an error, you move along, along this guy. Okay? You diffuse, if you like, in some direction. And now the question is, is, is as follows. How shall I pick out my code words? So these are the guys. The code words are these guys. Code words are the ones which engage all the qubits. And the code word for 0, that's how I encode 0, is this guy. And the code word for 1 is this guy. How shall I pick them up? I should pick them out so they're as far as possible from each other, because I don't want, to, I, I don't want them confused when an error happens. Okay? So what I really want is I want this guy, for example, to present state 0. This guy to represent, so I have to only represent uh, k qubits. So in a way, I have 2 to the k possible states. OK, these are the number of code words, if you like. Um, but I have 2 to the n all states, which I have. Okay. Only a subset is going to be code words. Why? Because when this guy starts to suffer errors, it's going to move around somewhere here. And this guy starts to suffer errors, it's going to move around here. But I don't want this guy to ever encounter that guy, because then I'm going to be confused. Which, which code word did they come from? Okay? So the radius of diffusion when my errors are happening around each of these code words, so this should be the code word, the radius of diffusion should actually never overlap between different code words. Because if two code words go into the same state, I'm screwed. I can't distinguish. I don't know where they're coming from. That will be the general, genuine error. So it's the same example here. Imagine that I allow two errors, but I've only got three qubits. 
Okay? And then, then this guy 0, 0, 0 could go into 0, 0, 1. But if I allow two errors, I can flip these two guys, and this guy can also go into 0, 0, 1 with two errors. No good. That's why I can't correct two errors with three, with three bits. So these are the same nine. I have no idea whether they're coming from this state or that state. That's what I'm trying to generalize there. So, so what's, the, what's the, I think you can see the, the, the equation immediately. Basically, the number of code words times the size of the sphere of each code word. Basically, Hamming introduced, introduced a nice measure to talk about the radius of this sphere, which is known as the Hamming distance. And the Hamming distance is the number of bits in which two different code, code words differ. So basically, you know, the Hamming distance between these two would simply be zero because they're the same. But if I flip one of these guys, then the Hamming distance is one because only one of these bits is different, and so on. If two bits are different, it's a Hamming distance two, and so on. And this radius is the Hamming distance now. And I want the Hamming distance here never to touch or at best to touch, but never to overlap with the Hamming distance possible from other, from other code words. So how do I do that? Um, N of these qubits can suffer errors, any of them. And the number of possible ways in which N qubits can suffer I errors is simply N choose I. And now I'm going to sum this up from no error to whatever is the number of errors you want to correct, eta. 15, 20, 1, I don't mind. Okay. So the number of code words, okay, times, if you like, this, uh, this guy, which is the number of errors that they suffer, should not really exceed the total number of, the total number of possible states, which is something like 2 to the n. That's the total space. So basically, if I multiply the code words times the area or the volume in, in, in this hyper in this hyper geometry, the volume of each of them, then I shouldn't exceed the total volume. If I exceed the total volume, that means that some of these guys overlap. And in this overlapping region, I don't know how to correct errors anymore. And this guy tells you, this guy tells you, given eta, tell me the, the tolerance you want to have, five errors. Given five here. And given how many bits I have in total, this is going to tell me how many different code words I can have. And if two is the only answer, that means I can only do one bit. If I get four, I can get two bits and so on. So this tells you the relationship between the number of code words and the total number of, of bits. It's just as simple as that. Now, quantum mechanically, this was derived first um, in, a, in a very simple way. And then people showed that you don't, you don't need to worry as much as that, basically. But, uh, but let me just, let me just uh, mention an obvious way of, of talking about this. So basically, quantum mechanically, the only difference that you have there is that every time an error happens, um, it can happen independently, like here, to any of the qubits. But there are basically three different errors that can happen to each qubit. So the first qubit can suffer sigma x, y, and z. The second one can suffer sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. Classical can only suffer one, one thing. So basically, the number, the number of errors that you have here is not just n choose uh, i, but there has to be an, a factor there, uh, which is 3 to the power of i. Why? Because if I have i errors, I could have had sigma x, y, and z times sigma x, y, and z times sigma x, y, and z and that's 3 to the power of i errors in this case. So if i qubits suffer errors, I've, I've got this factor here. And so it's a little bit more restricted bound. You can see that you have to, you can see that you have to uh, encode with a larger distance simply because this number here makes this volume larger for a given n. And we know that. So you cannot encode one quantum bit with only two extra bits. You can do one classical with two extra, but not one quantum. And if you really put, if you really want C to, e, to be equal to two code words, then you will see that this bound tells you, uh, and sorry, eta equals one, one error. Then you see that this bound gives you exactly n equals five. 
So five qubits will be able to encode one qubit. This is just two code words, one, one qubit against one error. Okay, so this is the quantum humming coming bound. And now you can you can basically derive this uh, this bound uh, in, uh, for for uh, any number of bits that you like and that you need. Okay. Now this is only half of the story of, uh, of error correction. And it happens to be half of the story for the following for the following reason. Um, let me see a little bit how to how to explain it. So it's half of the story because of the following. I, I have some bunch of qubits. I do some kind of unitary transformation uh, to encode these qubits. Then I have the middle bit which suffers noise. Then I have exact inverse of this encoding transformation. Okay, so this is U B code, which is U dagger and code. And I've got, I'm reading some kind of syndrome here, and then I'm correcting these guys out there. Okay, they come out as, as correction. So that's the circuit for, for, for basically encoding whichever number you like. And of course, now you will say, wait a second, you, you've done something very funny here. What you've really showed me is how to encode qubits themselves, the memory. But that's only half of the story when it comes to noise. What happens if, if each of my gates here is also noisy? And you see, this is very bad. Because I'm trying to protect against noise, but I've conveniently said to you that noise only takes place during this uh, period of time. And that would be very nice if you could say, well, wait a minute, don't act now. You know, let's, uh, let me just do this very quickly, and then now, now you can do whatever you like, and stop again, you know, I have to decode and allow me to correct. Of course, then you can do whatever you like. So the idea now is, what if each of these gates that encodes, and you, can, you saw how many gates I needed to encode even one, uh, one, one qubit. I, I needed two control knots. These are, in general, not simple um, uh, gates. And the question is, what if there is an extra error uh, of certain size which can also happen to your, to your uh, gate, not just to your qubit? How would, you, how would you now correct against that? It's a big question because it seems now I'm trying to fight a losing battle. Because while I'm trying to correct this noise in qubits, I'm going to be adding extra noise here. And the noise presumably will be adding up because, you know, maybe I cancel a little bit, but now I'm going to have extra noise here and here and here. And can I actually ever reduce this, uh, this noise? And, and this was considered by by a guy called Paul Neumann. Actually, he solved the problem, really. I mean, he solved it classically, and it's exactly the same solution in quantum, in quantum mechanics. So, so for, uh, for Neumann, I mean, I love these stories because it shows you how broad-minded these guys were. Um, when I talked about Turing, uh, I told you that his motivation was really artificial intelligence. Um, for Neumann's motivation was to actually um, to colonize other planets. Um, I believe this is going to become more and more important because I don't think we will solve any global warming and nonsense like that on this planet. And I really think if we want to continue to live, it will be another planet, okay, for better or for worse. Now, von Neumann said, rather than us going to another planet, let's send some robots there. Okay? In fact, he was actually explaining how life works in general, how it starts on, on our planet, but I think he phrased it as a as a bunch of robots. And then he said, what I want these guys to be, so I'm never going to be able to build something that endures forever. We all know that this is a problem. This is again the problem that life has to, has, to, has to solve in the sense that we all can suffer errors, we can all die, but somehow humanity is still here and there are many different species around. So there is certain error correction, there is some kind of intelligence behind it. And von Neumann, I mean, von Neumann was uh, at least 20 years before the whole DNA story and so on. So he somehow anticipated mathematically the whole structure, which is very interesting. So he said, what I really want is I want to have some robots that can suffer errors, but I want them to be, to be able to 
as they are suffering errors, to be able to scan their environment, collect enough bits, and, and basically make another robot. It's really like replication, okay? So he was asking, is it possible to replicate perfectly, a perfect copy, even though I myself am, in, uh, am imperfect? So I suffer errors while I'm trying to build a copy. You know, everything is, is noisy here. And the question is, can I really faithfully replicate with an arbitrary precision? So this is a famous paper by John Harman. I really encourage you to read his stuff. It's very simple, even though this guy sounds very scary, given that he contributed to almost anything in science, actually, in mathematics. It's so very simple. He writes very beautifully. Um, so basically, can I have something that, has, that is error-free, but is specifically <coughs> built of components which actually can suffer errors. And he asked himself, what is the error rate which I can which I can tolerate? And so what he did really is he here is how he did it, okay? And, and that's that's really called uh, called fault tolerance also in quantum computation. What he did is he said, let me do it like that. You know, let me encode one bit into three bits. Let me do some gates here. Let there be some noise and so on and so forth. So noise can, can now enter anywhere. It could be here, it could be here, it could be here. And I give you some threshold of noise. You know, let's say there is 10 to minus 3 probability that within the next microsecond something will happen. And now he doesn't even care where, the, where this happens. It could be on one of the qubits. It could be that the gate is faulty. I'm going to assume that. And what he says now is he says, why don't I now encode each of these qubits into three more qubits? And what's going to happen? So he said, why don't I expand this? This is called concatenation. And lots of you guys probably, when you read these papers, you may get the feeling that this comes from quantum computing. I mean, it was known 100 years ago, not 100, but 70 years ago. But on, on. So what he said is, I'm going to amplify this. This qubit is going to be three qubits, because now I'm going to protect it on top. You're telling me all of this can be faulty. Let me make sure that it doesn't, fault doesn't happen. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really nest uh, this error correction for each of the qubits. And so each of these guys will have some kind of gates that they will have to act across to, to enact this guy and so on, basically. Okay? And if you, if you open any paper on, on quantum error correction, you will get some picture of that type. And you say, all right, so now I have, I've, I've, I've basically amplified the probability of error. Why? Because, because what I did is I've, I've, I've actually increased the number of qubits. Here I only had three qubits that could be faulty. I've increased the three qubits to nine qubits, okay, three times more. I've also increased the gates from three ga gates to nine gates. So it seems I'm, I'm increasing the error. But each of them, within each of the encoding, pushes the, the degree of error to one level up. So, so this guy, basically, so if you think that every error happens with the probability epsilon, what this guy does is increases the error to epsilon squared. It says, I can deal with any epsilon error. Can't deal with epsilon squared, all right? So now, you are increasing the number of errors but really only linear, okay? But you are pushing this guy even higher. Now you go to E cubed. You say, I can now tolerate all the first order and the second order. Okay, let them happen all the time. I have no problem, but I'm gonna keep encoding and keep encoding and pushing this guy up. And this is gonna become exponentially smaller. And now you exactly have the trade-off between the speed at which you are generating errors by encoding more and more. This now becomes horrendously complicated because what I'm doing now is I'm using nine qubits to encode one qubit. This guy tells me you only need five qubits, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in fact, I'm, I'm using nine for just one error, like sigma x. So I'm really making it much worse than it is. And the idea is now, do I win this battle? And the answer is it depends what your error rate is. It all depends on how faulty your unit is. If your unit is very faulty, like 50%, you can never beat the, win this race by this, because everything becomes random. It's a little bit like channel capacity in some sense. But if, if your unit is below a certain level, and that's the level that form element derived, then you can see that you can actually beat the, 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 the noise, and you can always stay below any level you like, because you can raise this to any power you like. You can eliminate all n minus 1 errors and stay at the n level. It's 
So there's a critical number that for a classical computer is something, well, it's, it's different to a half, it's something like a third, I think, in this model. And he says, if, I, if, I, if you can guarantee to me that the error is not bigger than this, then I can always encode it to beat it down below any level I like. Quantum mechanically, unfortunately, it's not as good as that. It's not a third. But people have worked very hard in the last 15 years to reduce it to something like even, I think, 10 to minus 3 or 10 to minus 2. Okay. So if within a single gate step, you don't think that you have more than 1% error, then you can combine these guys, even though they are faulty, in the same polynomial logic, to a unit that's going to make the, this error arbitrarily small. If you, if you encode it once, it's going to drive it down to this level. If you encode it once again, it's going to be 3 and 4 and so on. And you can really bring it down below any, any level you like. So what this says is very beautiful. It says, you're doing experiments with ion traps. What's the, what's the probability that you can prepare your state properly? 99.99%. How well can you execute dynamics? 95%. How well can you have a readout? 99.99%. There's a Nature paper recently from Andrew Steen in Oxford. Readout is almost perfect. So he's got most of the components of the ion trap computer below the threshold rate. Now he's going to be able to execute dynamics properly, maybe keep it cool for long enough. And he's there. He's got it. Okay? So it's not maybe as difficult as, as it looks. Um, the tricky, so what's the, what's the, you know, what's the catch then? Why do people still uh, work on these things all the time? The logic is basically that you have to really see how to encode this most intelligently so that the errors don't spread around too much. I'm deliberately acting from one qubit only to one other qubit. If I start acting with control not gates from one qubit to many others, then when any one of these others suffers, it's going to go back to my single qubit. Then it's going to be, instead of a first order error, it's going to be a second or a third or a higher. So this kind of architecture, in many ways, is a typical, is a typical fault tolerant um, architecture. So in some sense, the, the message of the whole thing is, is that in principle, you can really encode uh, you can encode your, your errors very well, and, and you can beat this deeper here. Now, um, what I want to show you is one, one very simple example where this is really going to be very necessary. But I think this still has not been implemented properly. So I'm going to show you a very simple, forget Shaw's algorithm and things like that. I'll show you one very simple example, and I think I'm going to conclude with that, uh, with that stuff for today. So basically, I said that estimating a phase of something is one of the most important uh, problems in quantum mechanics, because basically everything is encoded in this phase. And the whole industry, there's a whole industry basically which works on this, it's called frequency standards. Uh, it's a whole industry trying to improve our clocks. You know that uh, being able to measure time well has, has helped us actually culturally very much led to all sorts of revolutions in our history. And even now this is a driving motivation. In fact, people who get Nobel Prizes from NIST effectively are paid their money to improve our clocks. But then sneakily they do some other experiments, get Nobel Prizes, and then go back to the boss and say, I'm really measuring time. Uh, and then, that's not really good. Um, so um, what, why does quantum mechanics help in this case? Uh, because if you, if, you, if you didn't have any entanglement, then you'd be doing what I said before. Apply a Hadamard, measure, and you would get something like cos omega t, sin omega t, the probabilities, and then you measure n times, and you get some kind of result, okay? So n qubits independently oscillating. So you're driving a two-level system and you're trying to measure the frequency at which it oscillates and that's all <coughs> that we, we're measuring the clock speed. Now, if you do n qubits here, what is the error in your estimate of the frequency? And typically the error scales is something like 1 over root n. This is a typical Gaussian kind of this, uh, distribution there. It's called the short noise limit, okay? So if you measure n of these guys, even if everything is perfect, just the fact that you have a finite sample here makes your resolution of the frequency inaccurate to 1 over root n uh, degree. 
Now, what these guys from NIST discovered, I think Dave Wannett was the person uh, in charge, was that if he could create a GH set state, okay, then basically he could improve this limit to something that's known as the Heisenberg limit. He could improve it by another root n. So basically, delta omega with an entangled state, I'll show you in a second, is going as 1 over n. Why? Because now you're picking up the phase at a rate which is n times bigger than here. Okay? So if I have an entangled state of n atoms, and each excited state of each of these atoms gets e to the i omega t, then n of these guys get e to the n i omega t. And when you put this into the probability distribution, you get an extra 1 over square root n on top of it, and you get the, the quantum mechanical, the best you can do quantum mechanically. It's root n improvement. A little bit like Robert's search algorithm. It's the same, it's the same speed up. Great. He published a paper he thought, fantastic. I'm going to improve the, the clocks and all this thing. And then he realized one small thing. These guys are super sensitive to noise. Super. They're very bad. Why? Because if you think about the noise as some kind of decay from the upper state, it could be dephasing, could be anything. Usually it's dephasing. If you think of this one as going into e to the minus gamma t times one, suppression, exponential suppression, then n of these guys together are going to go at the n times gamma rate. So I'm claiming that I'm gaining n in terms of the precision because I'm making the frequency n times larger. But any noise, and there's got to be some noise, is also going to go e to the minus n gamma t. So exactly what I'm gaining due to this GHS state, I'm losing due to noise. And they perfectly cancel each other out, and you get no speed up whatsoever. Okay? So it's bad news. You don't want to be doing it like that. And that's why I'm saying that even if you think of the simplest computation, but this one is super useful for us, even if you think of this guy, you actually have to engage in, in, in error correction. You can't just do it with the GFZ state because it's going to cancel all the positive things that you, that you have. So even in this case, people are thinking about how to do that. And I think it would already be a huge achievement to control something like three or four of these guys and show that there is an improvement of that type. And of course, then you want to maybe scale it to larger and larger algorithms. Let me stop here and uh, allow for questions. Suppose you, uh, you are capable to construct a uh, uh, Fisher reservoir yeah. to protect this state. This yes. uh, it's possible to change the story. It's possible. Yes. What you're saying is, suppose I somehow can really insulate <coughs> these guys in some very intelligent way. Uh, could I could I change this? And this is something I want to actually talk about tomorrow, which is, which are the other ways of error. I think ultimately it always boils down to some redundancy, in the sense that you'll be saying, I'm not going to use all 100 qubits, I'm only going to use 10 qubits. So even though it looks, some of these will look much more natural than, than what I presented in terms of error correction, but I think ultimately it will really boil down to redundancy. You'll be using a much smaller subspace, and that's why you'll be protected, because you've got the rest of the Hilbert space in some sense to take care of. So there are lots of ideas along these lines. There's decoherence, free subspaces, topological quantum computation. All of these guys are doing something like what you're suggesting now. But I think at the mathematical level, what they're really doing is just using small part at the expense of you know, wasting the rest of these uh, qubits. I'll talk a bit more about it tomorrow. It's a good subject for another separate uh, lecture. Uh, it, it, isn't this a little disappointing? Because it's uh, already extremely hard to go beyond 10 qubits, and now you say only yes. two days of them are useful. Yes, yes, you're right. Um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. That, that the negative way of looking at this is that even 
even to encode one qubit against one of these errors, it seems that we need nine qubits in total. Yeah. And we know that nine is almost the limit for most uh, most implementations of quantum computation. So you can say how are you gonna you know how are you gonna keep doing that for more qubits and so on. So you're right. It's a very difficult. Uh, it's a very difficult. Thing. The message here is really if you could if you could just stabilize one of these units, if you could classify this guy as as a unit that has a quadratically better behavior than the ordinary unit, then somehow maybe I can com combine these guys now. But of course, you have to be able to make this unit 10 times, put it coherently with the other one, and so on. It is very hard. The, the, the interesting thing is actually the guy who does these experiments is the guy who's, who's done most of the things on developing this code. The code's interesting. So in a way, he doesn't see this as a... As, I'm very happy that he is optimistic about it because he's got to do this in the lab as well. And he seems to think that this is okay. This will work one day. Mm -hmm. It will not stay, stay worse with the number of qubits. Again, theoretically speaking, it doesn't scale worse. But if you go... If you go to iron trapping people mm -hmm. and you say, look, you have some error rate there, and now you couple your system to the, <coughs> to the phonon bath, to the usual electromagnetic bath, you calculate the rate, they get a rate that's 10 times smaller than what they observe. So that's the problem with, with practical things. You can never predict what's going to happen and what can go wrong. So I would say at the theoretical level this works. But when you talk to, to people in practice, they will say, we have sources of noise we don't even understand. We have no idea what's going on. We can't model it in the usual way. And every complex system actually uh, boils down ultimately to trying to understand the noise. And it's very difficult. Very, very difficult. So it could easily be that this cannot be done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this. Yes. It's exactly like that. So in, in a sense, von Neumann's paper on classical computers, mm -hmm. it's not that it, it simply became superfluous. Classical computers no longer make errors in a sense. They're so stable that you don't have to beat flip in this way at all. So they've just overcome that. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that's the idea of some of these intrinsic error correcting things like topological. You know, can we find a system that's <coughs> intrinsically stable that I, that I don't have to actually encode on top of it and I just do some kind of computation. Because this is what we found in architecture for classical computers that is error free. Mm -hmm. You don't need to worry about it actually. Yeah, it's, uh, something like the engine the minus one P. Yes, uh, it's, it's so small that I think you never need to worry about von Neumann's uh, mm -hmm. algorithm. Uh, but now somehow we have to worry in terms of quantum computers. And the question is maybe one day we also have a nice architecture which overcomes and we don't even need to correct that. Mm -hmm. Paradoxically, Classical computers are, are stable precisely because they suffered infinite amount of errors. So if you think of a classical computer as a quantum computer, what's happened to it is that it's decomposed completely into just zeros and ones. You're not allowing anything else. So it's the quantum noise that's making your classical computer very stable in some sense. It's the quantum contribution to classical computers. Has a That's it. It's all possible errors. You don't have to worry about it. Interesting. Uh, I have a uh, talk about uh, general aspects about implementation. Yes. Uh, for example, uh, you need um, you get. Uh, Unitary transformations, specific unitary yes. transformations. So these unitary transformations do not appear in a natural way. And yes. then you can uh, engineer it. Some kind of interaction. Yes. Yes. Uh, what is the best track to eliminate uh, errors? I think the best is really to go to the minimum set of it. In, in a sense, iron traps are again considered nice because even if the two qubits are very distant from each other, you can couple this guy to this guy with exactly the same ease as you can couple these two guys because all of them are vibrating collectively. And the fact that they're sitting in the same mode means that when I add one phonon to that mode, all of them start to vibrate. They are completely symmetrical. It doesn't matter 
which of the two I'm going to now do a control knot. So what I'm saying is that a control <coughs> knot between these two is as easy as a control knot. It doesn't require extra pulses. But this is no longer true in, 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 in certain solid state implementations because usually you only have nearest neighbor interaction. If you have some Heisenberg exchange, then only the spins that are very close to each other are going to interact. If they are far apart, there is no, it's really something like nearest neighbor interaction. And this could be a problem. Of course, a computer scientist will come to you and say, this is not a problem at all. Let me show you how you can do it, okay? So a computer scientist would say, I'm gonna, you want to interact these two guys which don't naturally interact? No problem. I will swap these two guys, then I will swap <coughs> these two guys, then I will swap these two guys, and then these guys are nearest neighbors now and I can interact them. And then I go back, swap, swap, swap. How many swaps? As many as the qubits. Polynomial. No problem. It's not exponential. But I mean, you go and tell a physicist to do these now many swaps, you know, in, inside, a, inside a spin chain. I mean, that, that would be crazy. You know, you do 200 swaps this way and then we turn it back to compute. So, yeah, it is a point 